Flora Strickland hopes her prayers have finally been answered. Her family has been on a waiting list for public housing for four years. They've been living in this three-room duplex, struggling to stay warm by stuffing newspapers around the doors and leaving the oven open. But this week, the house was condemned, which is good news for the Stricklands because now their names will be moved to the top of the housing waiting list. I'm trying to get a house, you know, better house than this right here. The Stricklands have until Christmas Day to find a new place to live. If the Chattanooga Housing Authority is unable to find them a new home, the family says they don't know where they'll go. The Chattanooga Housing Authority has nearly 300 vacant apartments, so why are there almost 450 people on the waiting list? And they had plenty out them uh, Smith McCauley homes. I ride around, there's just a lot of them boarded up out in Emmerwell homes, Boone Heights, uh, Paul's homes. Just about everywhere you ride, you see them boarded up. They said they're not ready for people to live. I guess they have to fix them up. We found several public housing units boarded up in the Spencer McCauley neighborhood and on Gurley Street. How long have you lived here, Anna? Four years. Now, have a lot of the apartments been closed up since you've been here? Oh, yes. They were closed when I came in. They're still closed. We asked CHA officials why there were so many empty apartments. Director Bill Cooper said in Mrs. Strickland's case, she refused offered housing on August 7th of last year. But CHA has received a reprimand from federal officials because of their high vacancy rate, an issue they're expected to discuss at their board meeting tomorrow. Rebecca Cook, New Center 12. Past members. These scenes require a lot of time and hard work, but church members say it's worth it to bring the true meaning of Christmas to life for everyone to see. Rebecca Cook, New Center 12. Yeah. And while the house was extensively damaged, there is good news. No one was home at the time the blaze broke out, and we're told none of the firefighters' injuries were serious. Rebecca Cook, New Center 12. News to follow in years later. <laughs> These commercials can have a negative influence as well. In fact, this commercial, which was an ad for President Johnson's bid to retain the presidency in 1964, was pulled off the air after being shown only once because there were so many complaints against it. And the chance for negative... I'll pick it back up. Law enforcement officials are taking every precaution as they check all cars entering and leaving the area where the car was abandoned. Now, tonight's search efforts are being directed toward alleged sightings phoned in by local residents. We're, we're keeping an eye on that North Georgia appeal. When you come after the bid for bachelors, you've really got to have a lot of cash on hand. Some of these guys are going for well over $500, but I hear they do take all major credit cards. And of course, it's all for a good <laughs> Proceeds go to help protect these beautiful felines for the future. Rebecca Cook, New Center 12. Crawford might be surprised by what it has to offer. Imagine a taste of New York's Broadway right here in Chattanooga. Well, this time next year, these steps of the Tivoli could be crowded with people waiting in line to see such hits as A Chorus Line or 42nd Street. Stop spreading the news. I'm leaving today. So you're just trying to take a nice, leisurely afternoon stroll. But if you're in the area near Erlanger Medical Center, watch out. 
A mother mockingbird has set up house in one of the nearby trees, and she intends to protect her family. Now, most of the passerbys have no idea what's in store for them as they get too close to the bird's nest. But other regulars know to look out. I was walking down the street, and uh, next thing I knew, I heard something like, uh, Arr! and uh, felt something that hit my head. And um, after that, I looked up, and I saw the bird flying away. So I, you know, I told the next guy, that bird just attacked me, and everybody started laughing. People just walking up and down the sidewalk, uh, they get attacked ferociously by the birds. You know, they peck them in the head, they grab their hair by their uh, little feet, and, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's hilarious, you know. Well, I thought this whole thing was pretty ridiculous. I mean, really, how much damage can one little bird cause? So I thought I'd just come on over here and say, <laughs> Okay, so maybe I won't get so close next time. Anyway, this mockingbird doesn't really mean any harm. As a matter of fact, she hasn't hurt anyone, not even our cameraman. She's just being a protective mother. Rebecca Cook, New Center 12. After four long days of coming through the woods, volunteers were ready to give up their search for Bertha Decker. They had already decided they would call off their search at 3 o'clock, when at 12.35, one of her dogs was spotted. He took off running away. I saw her sitting there, and it's just, <laughs> it's unreal. I'm hungry. I know I need food in my stomach. <laughs> I don't have any food for you right now. We're going to we'll ask you to do one thing, thing for us, okay? Yeah, we go. We go. Go. You've been in here for four days. Five days. Go into the hospital. And we're going to have an ambulance well, waiting for you. That's when we, all right. We want you. I think there's no way to describe it. I was frantic. After it started getting dark, I started shaking. I got nauseous. I put my head over between my knees and I said, you're a grown woman and you got your stuff into this. You gotta live to find your way out or till somebody finds you. And after an extensive search, the 150 volunteers did find her and there was quite a celebration as she returned. That was a heavenly feeling. I felt that God had answered my prayers. Versa was most appreciative of all the volunteers who had helped to rescue her. God bless every one of you. Past Monday night at about 11 p.m., the uh, victim, Mrs. Montgomery, was approached. A lady came and knocked on her door, stated she wanted to use the phone. 76-year-old Dorothy Montgomery told police that the woman was about 17 years of age with shoulder-length blonde hair. She said she had car trouble and wanted to know if she could use the phone. She let her in, used the phone, she went back out. About five minutes later, she returned, stated she wanted to use the phone again, and as soon as she she got in, she asked her for a drink of water, and when the victim went to get a drink of water, she was, when she returned, she was suddenly grabbed from behind by a male, and when he, when he came around, he struck her in the nose. After the male suspect had beaten her, he forced her into this closet, shut the door, and pushed this heavy chest in front of it. It took the victim nearly 45 minutes to get out. Mrs. Montgomery suffered only minor injuries as a result of the attack. But the suspects did ransack her entire house and made off with some of her cash and her jewelry, including her wedding rings. At first, police regarded this incident as routine, but since have discovered another similar attack. I understand there was an occurrence uh, May the 5th that, that fits this almost exactly in Chattanooga, I believe down on 5th Avenue. At this time, we think it, it just about has to be the same couple who is doing it. This time, the couple struck at 75-year-old Mrs. T.L. Chastain's home on 5th Avenue. Again, an 18-year-old girl with shoulder-length blonde hair knocked at the door. She said her car was broke down over here, and she wanted to call somebody to get it, I reckon. And she asked me if I could use my telephone, and I, she looked all right, you know, and I... I told her in, I showed her where it was at. 
After using the phone, the woman left, only to return five minutes later, asking to use the phone again. Mrs. Chastain was then attacked from behind by an unknown man who took all of her money and locked her in a closet. That's where she was found a day later by a 12-year-old neighbor. There's around drowning that occurs while boating. State law requires every passenger in a boat wear a personal flotation device. Although you may know how to swim, you could be knocked unconscious if the boat strikes an object and you're thrown into the water. In fact, more than half the children were allowed to remain in the classroom. The Tennessee State Board of Education wants to avoid a situation like this here in our state. So they've challenged each local school board to develop their own policy to address the AIDS issue. Local officials over, even at low speeds. According to Consumers Union, federal statistics show the samurai has been involved in 44 rollover accidents, resulting in 16 fatalities and 53 injuries. But Suzuki argues their four-wheel drive samurai is safe. In fact, the controversy hasn't affected sales here in Chattanooga. The people that are coming... Safe and good time at Riverbend. New Center 12 reporter Rebecca Cook joins us now to tell us what's going on this year. Rebecca? Thanks, Sarah. It's hard to believe officials expect nearly 100,000 people to crowd the riverbank for this year's festival. And when they arrive, they'll have plenty to choose from. This year's Riverbend offers 10 days filled with food and entertainment for the entire family. impossible to list all of Riverbend's events, but here's a sample. Things kick off. Imogene Griffith has been waiting three days for any news at all of her son, Kenneth. He and two other men, Richard Mason and Earl Smock, have been missing since they left to go three-wheeling on Saturday. The family has been trying desperately to remain hopeful that the men were simply missing, but their spirits were dealt a harsh blow on Sunday when the men's vehicles were found covered in blood at the foot of a bluff. The first thing that entered my mind that they had killed him. And officials with the Hamilton County Sheriff's Department say all of the evidence seems to indicate the men were shot. One of the theories being investigated by the police is that the men left Richard Mason's home that Saturday night around 6 p.m., traveling down the road to a trail that cuts through nearby woods. Police believe the men were attacked nearly three miles into the woods. There are many theories as to what happened next. Those who have seen the evidence at the scene say it appears one of the men was attacked on his vehicle just off the trail. One of the other men apparently tried to drive off and was shot a few yards away. And the third man appears to have gotten off of his vehicle and attempted to run the other way into the woods and was hit there. Then the three-wheelers and the men were moved from the scene. They believe the vehicles were thrown off Roberts Mill Road, nearly five miles away. They were found there at the foot of a bluff. Today, police brought in a cadaver dog that specializes in locating bodies, but nothing has been found yet. In the meantime, family members try to comfort each other. He loves us so much that wherever he's at, I know he's fighting as hard to get back to us as we're fighting to get him back. My wife had walked out there today, and she said she'd smelled a sin out there. And uh, I was sort of suspicious that that might be what it was. And uh, without getting into any of the crime scene, I went around to the edge, tried to verify the fact it was bodies. I got down there pretty close, and I could see that there was three bodies piled together. So it was obvious, you know, it was these people that, that the search, massive search was out for. Authorities tell us whoever attacked 49-year-old Richard Mason, his son-in-law, 22-year-old Kenneth Griffith, and 23-year-old Earl Smock went to a great deal of trouble to dump their blood-spattered three-wheelers and bodies miles away from each other and the site where they were allegedly murdered. 
Authorities believe whoever shot the men loaded them up into some sort of four-wheel drive vehicle, then took them by back roads from Signal Mountain here to Suck Creek Mountain, where they threw the bodies off the side of this hill, hoping to conceal them among the garbage. Area residents tell us this site is somewhat of a dump and that people often drive by and throw their trash out along the side of the road. Sheriff's Department officials were gathering evidence here in an effort to lock down their case. Authorities tell us they're investigating several possible motives for the triple murder. The evidence suggests the men may have been surprised by the attack. Two of them were apparently shot in the back, the other in the side of the neck. There's speculation the men stumbled upon a marijuana patch. Narcotics officials have been on the scene all week and even brought in a helicopter today. That's 10 4. Where we were at down there, about a mile uh, back in the woods, it was real thick. There's also a theory that the men were involved in some sort of property or trespassing dispute. In fact, other people say they've been threatened by property owners in the area for trespassing. He told us we were up there and he got out of the truck and told us, you know, that. He didn't want anybody on his land, didn't want them trashing it up. Well, I've heard he's pulled guns on people, you know, so I don't know. He didn't pull one on us, and we didn't give him a chance to, you know, do nothing, so we left. And I haven't been back up here since. Rebecca Cook, New Center 12. A familiar sight returned to the roadways this morning. Students made their way to schoolhouses across the county earlier today. Some welcomed this first day of school eagerly, while others approached the situation a little more cautiously. But for the most part, the days of tears at the first grade classroom doorway are gone. Now most children are used to the school scene by six years of age, after a couple of years of daycare and kindergarten. And most of the first graders we talked to were enthusiastic. What do you think about going to school today? I thought it was great. Were you excited about coming to the classroom? Yeah. Why were you so excited? Because I, like, I never have been to first grade yet. And most of Jamie's classmates felt the same way. Some of them even had some plans for their first school year. What are you going to be doing here this year? Make more friends and stuff. Is that one of the good things about going to school? Yep. What do you think about going to school today? I'm glad. Why are you glad? Because I like school. What do you like about it? You can read. And there were others who were just enjoying the fringe benefits of being a student. Did you get some new shoes for school this year? Yes. Tell me about your shoes. The white and black with white strings. Well, what do you think is, is the best thing about going to school? Because it's fun. What's fun about it? We go to lunch. Rebecca Cook, New Center 12. It all began when a group of Battlewood apartment tenants sent their resident manager a letter complaining about crime in their complex. They felt they were not receiving adequate protection from the apartment management or the Fort Oglethorpe Police Department. So they called a tenant meeting to organize a neighborhood watch. The best police department you can have is within your own neighborhood. Barbara Holder was one of the tenants behind the organization of the neighborhood watch. She said all she ever wanted to do was protect herself and her family. I'm worried about what's in my door, what's stealing the gas out of these cars and anything else I can get their hands on. Sitting in these woods and sitting behind these apartments and sitting right out in front of these apartments, smoking pot, and they don't care if you see them. They will tell you there's nothing you can do about it. But Barbara decided she would do something about it, and she and her neighbors said they felt better after they organized their watch. But just three days later, she was called to the office, and the apartment manager gave her a warning. He says, you do have 14 days to cut out this mess that you have going before you cause a riot. I told him, we're not here for a riot. We're tired of all the garbage in our doorways. I informed him that I'll take my letter and go on out. He says, don't forget, 14 days, stop it or get out. I contacted the man Barbara said she spoke with, the property manager, Johnson Dodd of Commerce Realty. He said he knew nothing about the letter, and he told me the whole thing was ridiculous and he had nothing to say to me. I called the resident manager and got the same response. And when we arrived, the apartment office was closed. We tried to talk to her on camera, but she refused to come outside.
Alan Frederick was born and raised in Soddy Daisy. His friends say he was well known and liked among those in the community. He was a real good friend. He was quiet. Never messed with anybody. Never caused any trouble. You know, he liked to shoot pool. We'd see him around. He was friendly. What did most of your friends think when this happened? It was a shock to everybody. Alan was fatally shot Sunday morning around 3 a.m. at the home of 55-year-old Glenn Robert Coleman. Coleman told police he shot Alan because he startled him by jumping out of a closet. Tim Patterson went with Alan to Coleman's house that night. He claims they were invited by Coleman's granddaughter. Uh, the girl fellas told us to come over. She was climbing through the window. And uh, she said, if anybody come, go over by the closet. And uh, her grandma come in first. And she left, and her grandpa come in and went back out and come in. Pointed the gun at Alan and shot him. What did you do? I jumped in the closet. Did you stay hidden until the police came? Yes. Did, did Alan ask him not to shoot or anything? Yeah, he said, no, don't. Alice Brown with the Soddy Daisy Police Department explains the law concerning intruders. The homeowner must feel like that his life is being threatened before he can legally take any action against the intruder. Did you threaten Mr. Coleman in any way? No, we, we stayed in the closet. It will be up to a court to decide whether Alan Frederick's death was justified in the meantime, the family waits to pay their last respects. Rebecca Cook, New Center 12. Some people say the only difference between adoption and having a child biologically is the way the child joins the family. Ray is one little Chattanooga boy ready to become a permanent part of someone's family. Ray is a very impressionable little boy. He loves to have fun. He likes to play rough. He likes school. and. Uh, he's one of those kids that likes to work in school, not just recess. Ah. Tell him what your name is. Ray. And how old are you? Six. And you're a good boy, right? Ray was a little shy on camera, but he did tell us about some of the things he likes to do. Go swimming and play. And go someplace more. While Ray eagerly awaits a new family, Susan Ernest is just one of thousands of Americans waiting to add to hers. We just love children, and there's so many that need homes that uh, we're just trying to find some for us. Susan and her husband were among dozens of prospective parents who came out to the adoption fair to talk to counselors. It is a special feeling. We have so many children that grew up in foster care and never know what it's like to have a permanent family. So when you can find a child and match him with that forever home, it makes you feel so good because you know that child won't be one of those that grew up in the system. There are hundreds of children in the tri-state area in need of good permanent homes. If you and your family would like information on adoption, you can contact the local office of the Department of Human Services. In Chattanooga, that number is 493-6000. Rebecca Cook, New Center 12. Fifty-nine-year-old Larry Branham and his wife Betty were raised in Chattanooga. About 20 years ago, they moved to Irvine, Florida to open their own antique store. According to friends, the couple often met with prospective buyers and sellers after closing hours. On the night of June 26, 1984, one of these meetings turned to tragedy. They became fatal victims of a robbery. A store employee found their bodies the next morning, gagged and handcuffed to a safe. They had both been shot in the head, execution style. There were no leads in the case until last year when most of the stolen furniture was found in Nevada. Police soon arrested 30-year-old Lewis Wesley Barnes and charged him with the double murder. But Barnes broke out of a Florida prison where he was awaiting trial and the manhunt started again. Back in Chattanooga, the victim's family had just about given up hope when the story aired on the television program, America's Most Wanted. Marion County, Florida was stunned by the senseless killings of an antique dealer and his wife. Then, good news. Last night, San Antonio authorities caught Barnes after a high-speed chase. I'll tell you, I feel wonderful. Nothing will bring my, nothing will bring my brother and sister-in-law back. But uh, if they can, uh, since they caught him, Maybe they'll lock him up and keep him this time where th this won't happen to any other family. It's done so much to both sides of the family that I hope nobody else has to go through what we went through. Rebecca Cook, News Center 12.
YFF, Greenville. And now, with the morning edition, Rebecca Cook. This is News Center 4. Good morning and thanks for joining us. 32 degrees in Greenville, Spartanburg, as well as in Anderson. Asheville has a warm 43 this morning. Opening arguments are expected to get underway this afternoon in the Noah Robinson murder trial. But first, defense attorneys have some requests to make. They're expected to ask that the trial be moved to another part of the state because of pretrial publicity. And Robinson's lawyers have also said they will ask the judge to suppress certain evidence. The search for a missing six-year-old girl will resume at sunrise this morning near Greensboro, North Carolina. More than 100 law enforcement officers and volunteers are looking for Abigail Blythe. The girl disappeared from her yard Tuesday afternoon. She was last seen playing with her dog around 4.30. Her dog reappeared yesterday. The animal was wet, so searchers began combing a nearby creek. Bloodhounds had tracked the girl's scent to the edge of the water, but so far no sign of the child. South Carolina legislators are applauding Governor Carol Campbell for his State of the State address last night. Some of the high points included in the speech, economic growth, expanded opportunity, and better education for the state. Carl Clark has more. The governor devoted the largest... That would be misleading the people of this state. Governor Campbell concluded his speech comparing the state to a symphony filled with the harmony of growth and progress. We'll be back with a look at the weather right after this. This is News 4 Today. Good morning and thanks for joining us. I'm Rebecca Williams. Locally, we have 37 degrees, 32 degrees at this hour in Asheville. It's 645. Spartanburg County authorities have tentatively identified the remains of a murder victim found last week. Officials say they believe the victim is 18-year-old Matthew Arthur Griffin of Spartanburg. The skeleton was found by hunters last Wednesday in the Spring Lake community. Authorities say the victim was shot in the head. The coroner says they are still trying to locate dental records and x-rays to verify the identity, but clothing and jewelry found with the remains have been identified as belonging to Griffin. A mother charged with killing her three children in Franklin County, North Carolina, will be moved from a hospital to a prison this morning. A Franklin County grand jury indicted Katrina McKay yesterday on three charges of first-degree murder in the mutilation deaths of her children last month. Franklin County officials say a competency hearing could be set for two weeks from today to determine if McKay can stand trial. A group of Asheville citizens spent two hours yesterday making final pleas to the city council before a vote was taken on a hotly debated sign law. The council voted unanimously to adopt the law, one they say will improve the business climate by creating a more visually appealing city. The ordinance limits the size of signs and billboards in the city, and some officials think a more beautiful downtown will attract more tourists and convince more industries to locate in Asheville. But opponents of the law say it will spur countless lawsuits, put some people out of business, and leave the community bitterly divided. North Carolina is in the big leagues when it comes to recruiting retirees and their spending money to the state, so says a new study. The Tar Heel State is expected to see a net gain of $250 million to the state's economy from the movement of older Americans between 1985 and 1990. That puts North Carolina fourth behind only Florida, Arizona, and Texas. We'll check the weather forecast right after this. This is News 4 Today. Good morning and thanks for joining us. I'm Rebecca Williams. The Asheville area reports 32 degrees, 31 degrees at the south.